Hello and welcome to another Hawker Brownlow education video. Today we are going to be joined by the authors of Five Ways of Being. It's our book of the month uh, for June 2020. And it's a book which focuses on educational leadership, but challenges some of the assumptions often held about that topic. Through 32 evidence-based practical strategies, readers are empowered to embrace the five ways of being that will improve their ability to genuinely lead learning in others. And with that, we welcome the authors of Five Ways of Being, Jane Danvers, Heather de Blasio, and Gavin Grift. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought I'd kick it off with a very uh, simple question uh, that doesn't require much discussion at all. But um, what's leadership? <laughs> the simple question? <laughs> that's that's the, um, the multi-million dollar question, actually. <laughs> um, Gavin, do you want to start? Well, it's an interesting question because I think in some ways it's what drew the three of us together in different leadership roles that we have. But the shared passion that sits behind that question you just asked was that we need to discover that for ourselves and we need to work out who we are as leaders and how we can support others to work that out for themselves as well. Um, so in terms of really big picture, we felt quite compelled to uh, talk about that, um, share our experiences around that and, and do a little bit more research on that because we've felt that that's been kind of a missing piece a little bit in in some of the leadership work in in schools in particular so that that's kind of the synergy i guess between the three of us yeah i think the um piece for us was having been in leadership at so many different levels for a very long time the way that that concept of leadership has changed over that period of time and i think that that's been mirrored actually more in our society in the nature of the young people who are in our schools, but more profoundly in the people that we lead and that we work with and, and what's required for organisations to be really vibrant and to be true to their core mission, which is really getting everybody involved um, to grow and to flourish. And this notion that leadership is no longer about one person and it's no longer a, a triangle, that um, everybody needs to be really intentional about their leadership. And I guess that leadership is learned and it's it's an ongoing journey. It's an ongoing learning journey, no matter where you are in that leadership um, trajectory yourself. So we felt that we had found out a lot of things ourselves through our own experience that we found ourselves sharing across a range of different forums that we were involved in. And we wanted to encapsulate both for us, but also the people that we're in communication with what that, uh, some of those learnings were for us. I think um, building on what Gavin and Jane have said, I think the thing, the other thing that really we have in common is that we all believe that leadership is about enabling others. And it's actually about growing ourselves as well as leaders. And so it's, it's really about how we build capacity in others through building our own capacity. And from that, it sounds like, you know, one of the reasons why this book exists is that there was a, a real gap there in the literature uh, about what leadership actually is, particularly in the world of education. I think um, what we found was there is a lot of literature on what is leadership in education. And in some ways, it's difficult to work out well, who am I as a leader and what might this mean for me when there is so much. And so there was two lenses that ran through this work. One was given our influences, experiences, practical um, as, as well as theoretical, what can we bring to the space that maybe hasn't been as prominent? Uh, and that really, really dovetails off what Jane and Heather were saying around sort of, you know, building capacity and having learning sit at the centre. And the second part also was, but how can we be practical to help people in the moment when educators are so busy, no matter what level of leadership they might be in, um, it's great to absorb, it's great to go to a PD day and read a book and think about something, but sometimes I actually just need to go somewhere and find a way. Um, and so we were very mindful, and I know Jane was very um, influential on us both early in the piece to say, we must make sure this is, you know, practical. And, and I think that was really valuable because it meant that we had the lens of, but how do you use this? You know, if this is worthy of thinking about, 
what might it mean I can do with it tomorrow? Yeah, I think we wanted something that in any organisation, whether it's a school, an educational organisation, but I, I'm a great believer that leadership is leadership. You know, I have had the privilege of leading both schools but also leading other organisations that actually aren't educational, that are corporate or non-profits. And what the, the, the knowledge that and the deep belief I have is that being a leader, a good leader, it has the same um, qualities and the same learnings no matter where you are. And so what we wanted was a, a, a handbook, really, that, that gave a, a deep understanding of what leadership looks like, but something that you could go to and use in any organisation to start building that capacity and to start building that sense of leadership across your organisation because I think the what holds true for the person at the top holds true for every level of leadership. And that was very much the premise that we were working from. And we wanted something, we want our book to be that tag-eared, underlined, folded over workbook companion. And I know when I'm in a hurry and I think I just need this to be able to go and get it and do it was really, really important for us too. And I think we've all been involved in professional learning of um, educational leaders through through various um, venues and through various organisations, and we felt that in those in those sessions that we have run with other leaders, that we were all um, very practical in our approach to it, and that that was very much appreciated by participants in our workshops, and so we uh, they really wanted more, and certainly people had said to me in some of the conferences I've done workshops in you know, why don't you write a book about this? There's so much, we've only just touched the surface. And they really did appreciate the practicality because here were some things that they could just take with them and do tomorrow um, in a vital situation that they were in. And so I think that that was something that we felt was really needed. Well, in that case, then, what does a, what does a school look like that's um, fully embraced these five ways of being? Like, what's the difference between an ordinary competency-based leadership versus this fully um, fully embraced five ways of being leadership? For me, um, and this was the beauty of our partnership in some ways, it was the different contexts that we each come in to as well. I guess from my perspective, as someone who's worked in, geez, thousands of schools really over over 10 to 15 years, you, 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 you consume culture. <laughs> You walk into a place, you talk to people, you you listen to people, and you can detect a real difference um, in different cultures as you do your work. And fundamentally, the core difference between a school that's embracing, you know, learning as their fundamental purpose um, in their leadership um, to those who who may not be or may be having challenges doing that for a whole range of reasons um, is just what you hear and what you see. Uh, it's it's exactly as we named in the book, you know, what what we think is basically what we do and what we say. And so I just found it it's palpable that you can walk in and you can hear and you can see and you can get evidence of that too um, in different places around, you know, results and data. Um, but I was more interested in the people aspect and that's where my work always takes me around. What, what am I hearing differently? What am I seeing differently? How are these conversations framed? Um, differently to ones that are not, if learning really sits at the heart of, of what we do. And, of course, we're not just talking about learning of the students um, necessarily, or we're talking about the learning for ourselves and the learning with one another about how we get better at what we do. Um, so I guess there was always this, there's always this notion that that's as, as much of an interest and a commitment to staff in the school as doing the actual work is, which um, Jane was referring to before. Um, and so for me... That's one of the biggest differences. And again, we've said as, as we were working on this and as we've collaborated so much, you know, it's not even about good and bad, it's about different and about what we think makes us future ready. Uh, and that's a big part of the framing up of the, up of the book. And so I think we position ourselves based on our experiences to say, well, that's what we need to commit more to because you know, the world we are heading into is, is an uncertain and complex one. I mean, look at what we're, we're all grappling with right now. Um, so, uh, that's probably where, where my experience anyway has come from. What do you think, Jane? Does that, does that, how does yeah, that sit with I, you? I, I think that sits really well with me, Gavin. I think the thing for me, a school that really embraces 
leadership as a way of being is a school that has a really powerful um, culture of agency where, where, and growth, a, a really growth-focused, highly trusting um, environment. Because what you're doing is you're being really authentic in what you're saying and doing. You're, you're allowing people to take risks. You're allowing, and I know that it sounds, you know, it's the latest parlance, you know, trust and, and vulnerability. But it's true. I've seen it in action that when you actually give people that um, trust and the capacity to build their leadership and to talk about, and you model that from the top at all levels, that what is at every level of leadership, we're all doing the work of leadership and that we're really clearly and explicitly identifying for our organisation what that looks like, sounds like, feels like, how we keep on reflecting that that, that that actually spending time on that, what happens is it empowers everything. It, it, it enables things. And I think during this time particularly, during COVID, that was really palpable to me, that the schools that actually were able to pivot and were able to respond together and take their culture with it, had those lines of sight in terms of their leadership and they were doing the work so that they were able to really work together and it wasn't up to one or two people to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a much richer um, opportunity to, to build culture but also for outcomes for kids, for, for students, but also I think they're much more um, interesting and dynamic places to work. So I think that they really do grow people and um, and then there's that really shared commitment. So it's not people trying to second guess each other or watching their own back or the politics that often takes place in any organisation, I think uh, disappears in a way um, and it becomes a far richer, more open and collaborative, truly collaborative culture of people working for. But that's because... Um, yeah, you know, there's a shared story, there's a shared narrative about leadership and everyone's doing work. I think for me it's about um, if you look at leadership as a way of being, it's a far more holistic approach to leadership and it's actually kind of acknowledging that um, there needs to be alignment between the, the things that we say, the things that we do, and the, and the things that we think every day, but also how that is reflected in our body and how we are present in our in our space as leaders within our schools. So for me, it's a, it, it, it enables a leader to be uh, far more grounded, far more present, far more holistic in their leadership and not sort of thinking that, ah, oh, there's these skills I need to tick off on a tick box and become competent at because that's um, quite superficial and unless they're deeply felt and lived and comes through um, the way that I'm present in a room, the way that I'm present with another person, then and then people will see through that and they will not, will not believe in you, they will not trust you. So to me that it's actually about that authenticity, um, that when you see leadership as a way of being and, and which when you think about yourself, who am I as a leader and who do I need to be in this space, then that actually really seeps through everything that you are thinking and doing and saying. If you pay, keep paying attention to those aspects of it, then you come across as a far more authentic leader. And we think that some of the things we've done in the book in terms of uh, the different strategies, and there's that whole range of strategies in the book, over 30, are ways that leaders in schools can work together, can sit down and in a structured, systematic way do the work together to get to that point, to, to challenge themselves to support each other in that growth journey. And I think that you know, we can read a lot about what it is to be a good leader and we can go out on leadership. You know, there's a huge industry in leadership training courses. Um, but, you know, if you go away and you're not doing it with the people that you are interacting with every day, I don't know how much change the organisation under you know experiences. Whereas we believe that going through these strategies um, together and they can take place in meetings. You know, one of the things that we've made a commitment to do is to spend you know 
dedicated time, to give dedicated time to our own leadership development as much as strategy. You know, there's that wonderful Peter, well, supposedly Peter Drucker, no one really knows, but, you know, that culture trumps strategy every time. We know that. So building of the culture, but often we don't do the work on that. We're fixed on strategy, mm -hmm. we're fixed on outcomes. But actually spending an equal amount of time building ourselves as leaders, that is the thing that defines culture. We know from all the research that you can talk as much as you want about culture, but if the leadership aren't actually living that, being it, talking it, saying it, if, what, if there's a mismatch between the values of the organisation and what the leader's doing, your culture goes to hell and, you know, down the drain. So that we think that what we've done here is actually set up a way that um, people and leaders within schools and elsewhere can talk to each other, can practice, can really unpack for them what it takes to actually build that, that culture where people can grow and flourish. And it starts um, with that authentic leadership right from the centre, I think. I think that um, all of the strategies in the book are things that we've all used ourselves and certainly in um, they have been developed to meet particular needs that we have found in our schools um, that we have needed ourselves as leaders and also for our leaders within the schools. So, um, we, you know, they've got a lot of experience behind them and they've got a lot of uh, other leaders within our settings that have used these strategy to support them in their work as leaders in those areas where they don't know what to do necessarily they might get stuck um, and so I think that the the strategies themselves are as we've all been saying one of the big differences with this kind of book on leadership um, because and not only are they helpful and really practical but they are things that we have actually honed and adapted in our own work to meet the needs of the people we work with and learnt from, <laughs> yes. you know, and that's the whole point of this, you know, learnt from this, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, we, we have, even in our conversations, talked about all the successes that we've had and, and the, you know, the not so um, successful pieces, but that's part of, part of leadership. But I, I think what each of us want to really try hard to do for the reader and for the leadership team, as, you know, Jane was referring to before back at the school, is open up a conversation about things sometimes we won't talk about. You know, if, if culture truly is what's happening when no one's looking or listening, then what does that mean for us? And we hope, and I've already had conversations with some, some colleagues who are already using the book, um, what it's doing is opening up and giving them a space to have conversations around things that they might ordinarily avoid. Um, whether that be in themselves or whether that be with other people. And that, that was music to my ears to hear that from two people because in some ways that's why we wrote the book, um, to give them yes, as Heather was talking about, those strategies that we've been referring to and honing, um, but also some of the thinking that often we'll either do on our own or we'll avoid because it's hard, um, you know, when we're, when we're leading teams or leading schools or just coming to terms with what leadership means um, for us in our roles. And... On that note, just to, I guess, wrap up, we've got the five ways of being. Being trusted, or trusting, being brave, being a storyteller, being purposeful, being growth focused. Um, could if each of you describe which one you think is the most important? <laughs> now, obviously they're all important, otherwise it would be three ways of being or 12 ways of being. Um, but what do you think if you had to have a staff member who uh, exhibited one of these traits uh, more than the others, what would it be? I might kick start that one. And this is only literally beca because I've got some data last week on this piece. I, it's like, you know, picking your favorite child. I don't have a favorite child. I just love them differently. <laughs> um, but for me, what's what I hear from my colleagues when I'm working with them, particularly in the professional learning space is our first well, it's not our first chapter, but our, our first piece around being trusting, um, because that seems to be one when I ask, and I have collected some data on that, that people find the hardest to apply um, because of a whole range of experiences that they've had or, you know, different cultural elements, personal and professional things that may get in the way for them. It's not always easy to be trusting, um, and particularly if you've been burnt before or, you know, you lack confidence or you're new to a role or, 
there's a whole range of reasons why you might not be, but I think for me, and I'm glad it's positioned first, that that's a really important one to help people through because in some ways when we can be more trusting, we need to be more brave and we can be a little bit more purposeful and they, they seem to sort of um, come from that. But literally I've only thought about that in the last week since having some conversations with people and just collecting some data um, from, from my colleagues. I don't know how that sits with um, Jane and Heather. I don't have a well. I don't have a favourite too. But seeing you've actually pushed pushed us, Richard, I'd have to say being purposeful, um, because to be quite honest, I think that uh, everything everything else will fall into line. And if you have your purpose and you know clearly what it is, then you actually know where to, what that will guide you to make all the other decisions that you need to be and enable you to be more trusting because you know what your purpose is. We're not having a fight here about this. <laughs> but for me, it's all about if I know my purpose, then I can make some very intentional choices about everything that I'm going to do and why I'm going to tackle things in a certain way or how I'm going to speak with people, how I want to be in my demeanour how I want to actually use my voice, my body language and everything else. So for me, that's probably the most important if I have to make a choice. Yes. So I believe exactly as both Heather and Gavin have said, being trusting is a really important place for me. But I think my job as a leader and in the organisations I lead is around believing that people have the capacity to grow. And if um, you come that every person who you have responsibility in a leadership, um, in, in your sphere of leadership, and if you go in and you believe, if you sincerely believe that they have the capacity to grow and learn, you will approach your leadership differently. And I think that there are some ways that you can really build that culture. It's certainly what we do as teachers if we're thinking within an educational context could context that belief that young people can learn and grow and that not that intelligence and learning is not fixed. If we can bring that same generosity of thought um, to our leadership and to the people we lead, then I think that there is huge potential. So it is really thinking about the unlimited potential of the people um, that it is our job to enable um, to flourish. So. Uh, three different things. I kind of, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not prepared to go with that with just one because I think that they work, they're so interconnected. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go with growth focus. I think that you've, that's beautiful though, Jane, because you've highlighted, I mean, the three responses, just how interrelated all of this is. I mean, it was funny, I think it was Heather in, you know, just texting during the, um, during what we've been going through recently said, oh, I think we needed to write being connected <laughs> when we we're going through COVID-19, you know, which is sort of threaded through the five ways of being, but isn't a, is a way of being on its own. So they are so interrelated in so many ways. Um, but hopefully, I guess more importantly, they're really useful as a lens for people to think about their leadership through and apply things to um, based on whatever context they or situation they find themselves in. And that's, that was the challenge of writing this book, um, trying to achieve that from a, from a, through the lens of the person who will be picking it up. Some great conversations to be had with the people you work with. Some of the richest conversations the three of us have ever had is when we've actually been in these spaces using some of these strategies. They've been some of the most challenging, um, but if we talk about growth or trust or purpose, um, they're the things that have actually accelerated our journey, and that's what we're really excited about, um, what we've been able to pull together, really. Thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon. Your book, Five Ways of Being, is available now at hbe.com.au. So thank you uh, very much for your time this afternoon. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having us.